All right. Hey, welcome, everyone. So I'm going to talk about Fedora CoreOS and Live Pixie. Uh, when I start this talk, I'm going to go pretty broad, because there's a lot of stuff that's pretty new here. But then I want to so I'll go kind of broad and then do a, a sort of deeper dive into the, into the Pixie and Ignition, uh, advanced Ignition. So I'm actually taking over this talk from Andrew Jetalo, uh, former Ignition maintainer. He went on to do other things, um, but he did a lot in Ignition, and hopefully I'm channeling his, uh, his vision. Um, talked with him some about this talk, and hopefully uh, what he wanted to have uh, will come through here. Um, yeah, so yeah, I work on CoreOS and OpenShift. Uh, I've been contributing to free and open source software for a long time. Uh, and I like to start all my, all my talks by saying why I do what I do. Um, I love working on free and open source software. Uh, just it feels like we're all collaboratively building something together. And because software is just kind of a foundation of our society, like what we're building now is going to power you know different businesses and nonprofits and all sorts of things for years and years to come. So uh, yeah, it's just uh, it's just really really fun to do and important. Um, let's see. So let's start and let's talk about Fedora. So Fedora is a bunch of things. Remember, we're talking about Fedora, CoreOS, and Pixie. Well, let's start with Fedora. So Fedora, in the in the ecosystem that is our distributions, is leading edge. We really want it's the place where where new features are landing, and we have a number of those actually in the Fedora CoreOS side. I'll give some examples, but it's where you know we track the latest Linux kernel. Uh, and it's also crucially a great the place to start if you want to contribute to the ecosystem that you know the Red Hat has uh, that leads into CentOS and and Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So it's a very vibrant place too. I love like the activity on the development mailing list. And as I'll mention later, Fedora CoreOS is Fedora, so like you, you, we inherit all that that happens there. Um, obviously, Fedora is the upstream for RHEL. But one thing that comes up a lot, and this is really important here, is Fedora is not just a desktop system. I, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to and they say, I run Fedora, and they always mean as a desktop. They never mean as a server. I mean, 1% of the time, that's what they mean. So that's something that we're trying to change. And that's actually pretty profound. You know, How do we manage that? How do we make Fedora into something you want to use as a server? So before we get to the core OS part of Fedora core OS, the whole technology industry you know, kind of evolves in layers. We've added virtualization. And when we added virtualization, it didn't change how you manage the operating system. The role of the operating system is basically worked the same. You know, we added you know, things like Vert.io to optimize how you do uh, guest host communication. But again, if you did Puppet on your bare metal machines, you did Puppet inside your VMs too. Broadly speaking, um, containerization, though, deeply impacts how we think about the operating system. And you see this tension over and over in Fedora, of course, because we're not getting rid of the way things worked before. Like, you still have traditional Fedora. Fedora Core OS is for, you know, we're optimizing for containers, but we can't just stop what we did before because it's heavily, heavily used. Um, and a great example of this tension came up in the minimization talk was basically like, if we, right now we ship an Apache container that includes the RPM. And because it includes the RPM, it drags in systemd. And it drags in systemd because that's how you run Apache if you yum install it on a traditional system. So we have, we have these interacting ecosystems. Um, but containerization is deeply, deeply impacting how we think about the operating system. And this trend really accelerated with the introduction of Container Linux. Um, Red Hat acquired uh, CoreOS, what, three years ago now? And uh, we, we're trying to inherit um, the direction and uh, momentum that Container Linux started with, with Fedora CoreOS. Because Container Linux was, and it still is, very, very widely used um, for a whole lot of different things. And there are a couple ingredients, I think, that we're, we're preserving. I'll get to that in the next slide. But the important thing with Fedora Core OS here is that we're taking, it is a successor to both Container Linux and Fedora Atomic Host. Um, there was a comment on LWN from someone who, well, I guess I won't go into that. But I guess what I'm trying to say is we're, uh, we're really combining 
these forces, and we're putting a lot, we're putting a lot of effort behind Fedora OS. Um, it means a lot to, to our team, and uh, yeah, we really wanted to inherit this mantle. Um, so again, taking the momentum of, of containerization. Another aspect of Fedora Core OS is also upstream to RHEL Core OS. And I'm not going to talk about RHEL Core OS too much in this talk, other than to say that we have closely tied it to OpenShift currently. And it is um, it's kind of Kubernetes native operating system is the way I like to describe it. But the, the sort of core ingredients of what we think of as Core OS go into RHEL Core OS 2. So if there's something you want to land in RHEL Core OS 2, please contribute to Fedora Core OS first. You know, everything we do there is free and open source. We have public community. Um, I think we are pretty good at the sort of rough consensus working code model. Um, yeah, again, like we really want to preserve, preserve and build on the huge community that Fedora is. Um, well, also interacting and, you know, so for example, maybe we're also pushing back against Fedora in certain ways. Um, because again, we're trying to make a, a server uh, that you can install for a while, and that you know there are a lot of uh, changes there. Actually, a great example is the C Groups V2. Fedora Core OS today still uses C Groups V1 uh, because we include Docker, which doesn't support it. It's a great example. Um, so we are taking some divergence there, but anyways, upstream to RHEL Core OS. Uh, yeah, and I just really have to emphasize here that like definitely the vision I think is that it is Fedora, like it. It's a different way of managing a Fedora system, but like some things should feel very familiar to people who are longtime admins. But we also want it to feel very familiar to people who are container Linux admins, um, which is a balance, a tricky balancing act in some ways. Um, just recently came out a preview, so um, uh, yeah, check out the Fedora Magazine blog post if you want more details of that. And one of the things I think is most interesting about Fedora Course is we're also tying it to OKD, which is our upstream for OpenShift. So if you haven't tried OKD, you can get a Kubernetes cluster the same way the, the OpenShift product works, except we're tracking Fedora Core OS. So I'm really excited about what we're going to do here because that's going to provide a, a lot of additional testing for Fedora as a Kubernetes host. Um, well, you know, Fedora is tracking the latest Linux kernel, so if we want to prototype out C groups v2 and how that works in Kubernetes, you know, having that land in Fedora Core OS and OKD first will be a great way for us to do that. Um, yeah, so that's that's gonna and it, yeah, basically just ties together communities in a new way. So we talked about Fedora, talked about Core OS. So, but when I say Core OS, what does that really mean? So we talk about okay, you know, we're emphasizing containers. Um, you know, it's server focused, but, but let's get in the details, right? So Fedora Core OS, like what we're talking about when we say Core OS is a fusion of technologies from the original container Linux, which was called Core OS until it was renamed. Naming is hard. Uh, and uh, Atomic Host and uh, things kind of from the traditional Red Hat ecosystem. Like, so for example, SE Linux can't tell you, it was a lot of effort to make Ignition work with SE Linux, for example. A lot. No one will ever know how much effort that was. It was a lot. Um, but yeah, we're, we're fusing, fusing these technologies. So what is Ignition? Uh, Ignition, basically, if you, if you come from the traditional Red Hat ecosystem, Ignition is a single replacement that works across Metal and Cloud that replaces Kickstart and Cloud in it. Uh, Ignition runs in the initial RAMFS. And the core, one of the core principles of Ignition is that it runs exactly once, and it either succeeds in whole or it fails. So you know if your system boots and you provided it an Ignition config and that succeeded, your system is in that state described by that Ignition config. It doesn't, it doesn't vary. So the, the great contrast here is Cloud in it because Cloud in it kind of runs right in the middle of your boot process, and if it fails, your system can just kind of be partially configured. Um, it might still be accessible by SSH, but you know you, you kind of have to log in and check to see. Or if Ignition fails, it stays in the RFS and you can't talk to it over SSH, um, which does make debugging a pain. But one of the things planning to do is basically support dumping the failure to a remote host. So again, the kind of principle here is that it's, 
I really don't like this term, but the most popular form is called immutable infrastructure, where you're not kind of logging into the machines periodically to like move them to a new state. It's uh, if you want, the basic idea is you start your system in this desired configuration, then we have automatic updates. So getting to automatic updates, RPM OS tree is the ingredient we took from Fedora Atomic Host. Um, I've been working on the OS tree and RPM OS tree side for a long time. Um, I'm really passionate about making sure that updates are fully transactional and offline. I, uh, yeah, because if you're applying updates, period, right? Applying updates is just a crucial aspect of maintaining software infrastructure. I think it's, it's somewhat irresponsible to, to start uh, an operating system and not have a mechan like not have a procedure and mechanism to keep that up to date. I do believe that over time we are improving the security and reliability of Linux and the ecosystem on top of it. So you know, enabling updates is is crucial. Um, let's see. So yeah, the automatic updates on by default is true today for Fedora Core OS, and this is a large part of our what we well now yeah about I don't know twenty percent roughly of like kind of what we're focusing on. Like there's new tools here. Um, so what actually drives RPM OS tree, I didn't mention it here, is a tool called Zencaddy that knows how to, it basically has pluggable infrastructure for coordinating reboots of updates. Because if you run more than one server, you don't want them all to update at the same time. right? Um, and that was something that uh, Container Linux had a couple iterations on. Uh, that also is completely replaced by the machine config operator in RHEL Core OS. I won't go into that too much, but uh, just an aside. Uh, yeah, and obviously container focused. Um, there are a number of other related projects, like uh, a toolbox. Like we kind of really want, when you log into a node, to rather than think, oh, I have to debug something, I'm going to yum install strace, is you toolbox and uh, yum install strace in there. Or you want to do some BPF tracing. It's like, not, don't put that on the host. Do it in your toolbox container so it's separate. Uh, that keeps the host small. And so when the next kernel security errata comes out, you have a smaller update to apply. Your, your debugging tools can wait, right? You want to apply your kernel security errata. OK, so we talked about Fedora, talked about Core OS. Let's talk about Pixie. Um, Pixie is a bare metal provisioning infrastructure. So in this slide, I, I was starting to describe Pixie, but I realized I really wanted to make an entirely different point, that Fedora Core OS isn't just about clouds. It's about we want to, because containers apply everywhere. Containers are orthogonal to virtualization. You can, you can use containers on bare metal, and this actually makes a whole lot of sense. Um, actually, I think we basically, virtualization should be inside containers. So we want Fedora Core OS to go wherever you want to go. And that, that includes you know, public cloud infrastructure as a service, whether that's GCP or AWS or you know, on-premise OpenStack. If you want to virtualize, that's great. You know, we have builds for all those but we also want to run on your bare metal machines. Um, because for me, like, part of working on free and open source software is you, it's your computer. You should have control over your infrastructure. And that's, that's actually an important point of where, why you want to use uh, Fedora Core OS Live Pixie. So when we do builds of Fedora Core OS, we get basically an OS tree update, which is something that nodes can do in-place updates to. But we also generate a huge variety of image types, like virtual machine images and, um, and this live Pixie media. So what does Pixie, Pixie actually mean? So when you start, the system is in the BIOS, or UFI. And that system, the, the BIOS will do a DHCP request. And from there, uh, if you've set up the server, it will reply, and it'll provide a kernel and an init ramifest. And then so here's where it becomes, and so normally when a system boots, uh, the initial RAMFS transitions into the real root file system. So if you have a persistent install, it kind of works the same way. But um, here, we basically, we, we run ignition in the init RAMFS, and this works the same way as if you boot Fedora Core OS in a cloud or for a persistent install. Um, where things start to diverge in this setup is that we basically have the full root file system inside that initial RAMFS. So you press power on in your server. The, that firmware goes out over the network and retrieves all this stuff. 
So this is what it actually looks like to set it up. There's a couple ingredients here. For, for Linux admins, um, hopefully about half this is familiar uh, if you're already maintaining Pixie infrastructure. So the, the IP equals DHCP, for example, tells uh, the booted system to go out and do DHCP as well. Uh, the the rd.neednet is part of Drakeit. It's, it tells it, you know, please uh, wait for networking. There's some console arguments that tell you where to output the console. Uh, the ignition arguments are new to Fedora Core OS uh, and derivatives like raw Core OS. The ignition platform ID says this is a bare metal system, which because basically ignition needs to know how to fetch its configuration depending on what what uh, platform it's running on. So for example, if you're running in Amazon Web Services, we need to fetch from the metadata service, which is on a link local IP. So the, the OS needs to know what platform it's on. That's basically what's going on with this kernel argument. The, and then here's, here's where you start to configure things. So what we're going to look at is some ignition configs. And what you provide here on the kernel command line is a link to your ignition config. So if you think about uh, analogy here as if you're booting an instance in, in infrastructure as a service like uh, OpenStack, then this would kind of be what you would put in the user data field. It's, it's basically the, the same thing. It's the node boots, ignition runs, and it fetches this config, and the config can start doing a whole bunch of other things. OK, so let me actually do a demo here. Oh, this is what I want to link to. So if you want to actually try this on your infrastructure, and you can do this in a virtual machine, too. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to demo that. If you're doing bare mode deployments, I would actually highly recommend like, kind of having infrastructure for testing changes in virtual machines before you roll out to your bare metal. It's just a generally useful thing. Um, so basically, you go to Git Fedora, click on bare metal and virtualized. And over here, there's downloads for the kernel and the initial RAM disk. Now, I already did this download, because as far as you all know, don't trust the Wi-Fi. Um, yeah, let's go, yeah. So what I wanted to demo here, so this is Vert Manager, and I'm actually sort of cheating here because you can set up uh, Pixie in, uh, in Vert Manager. You know, like basically you need two VMs, and then you, know, you run a Pixie server on one, and you actually kind of really want to run a, an isolated network for this. Uh, so I'm sort of cheating here because I'm basically telling um, Libvirt and QMU to just directly boot the kernel, which is almost the same thing that happens when you Pixie, because basically, it, you know, instead of having the kernel be provided over the network, it's just directly entered by QMU. So cheating, but it's it's basically almost the same thing. The only detail here is um, if you go back to this thing, there's this. Um, magical option IP append in the Pixie Linux config. And what that does is it tells the BIOS to, set, to tell the operating system which network interface it's booted from. Because that's actually very important in some scenarios. Like you might have a management network and a, um, you know, like a sort of front end network. So you know, I'm, I'm basically ignoring that part. Um, I don't have multiple NICs in this VM, but that's, that's kind of the idea. So I have all those same kernel arguments uh, that was in the demo. But the most important thing to look at here is this one at the very end, this SSH basic uh, ignition file. And can you guys see this OK? Maybe I should try and increase the font size. Let me see. Um, can I close this? Is that? Yeah, it's pretty readable. So one thing I didn't mention is ignition is sort of intended to be a low-level language. It's JSON, which is human editable-ish. Uh, you know, you always forget to add the comma or remove, yeah, not have a trailing comma and list and all that stuff. So you can human edit it, but uh, the idea is that we have higher level languages that basically compile to Ignition, which is also a big difference compared to cloud init. And yeah, so part of the idea is these higher level languages might have specific knowledge about the operating system that might turn into a bunch of things like systemd units and scripts and stuff. I'm not using much of this here. This is kind of just a, the most, one of the most bin, minimal Ignition configs you could make that just has my SSH public key and uh, you know, creates a user Walters and adds me to the pseudo group. The enabling SSHD service is not necessary. I don't know why I added that. Um, yeah, and you can also tell here I'm bad at key rotation. It's from 2015. All right, so let's go ahead and 
boot this. Let's give it a second. So it's very exciting to see Linux boot, but uh, give it um, a minute here. So what we're actually seeing right now, we're in the initial RAM disk, and we, we did a DHCP request there, ignition ran, and fetch that config that I have running from a, uh, a local, yeah, I'm just, I basically have these ignition configs on my host. Um, I'm just running a web server and they're stored in Git. This is kind of a good way to do it. And it's not doing anything. That's awesome. Uh, I just tested it. Um, well, okay. It's cool to see things fail because then, um, then it's actually very descriptive of, wait. Oh, I know what happened. I rearranged um, where this stuff is, uh, and my web, web server was running in the wrong directory. I moved this stuff to a directory. Uh, call it an server. Oops, I wanted to be in the assets directory. So if you look, oops, look in here, basically I have a couple ignition configs that I'll demo. Let me run the web server again. And what you saw here actually is, is, is kind of actually an interesting one to go into. It's because when it fetched the config, it got a hard 404, and so that made it fail fatally. Um, if it fails to fetch the config and there's like an internal server error or a transient network error, ignition will sit there and retry. But if it gets something that says this config doesn't actually exist or it's malformed, it will fail fatally. Okay. Let's try that again. Force reset. No. Okay, cool. We found the ignition config this time. And yeah. We are booted. So one of the things, one of the nice things we actually took from Container Linux is uh, changing the console to include your uh, your IP addresses, your SSH keys. It's one of the things that uh, actually actually also involved a non-trivial diversion into making divergence into making this work with SE Linux because we kind of had to like tie together a couple of different processes. You know, when you change when you tie together a bunch of different things, that you need to change the SE Linux policy. So yeah, it's just an example of like where we're preserving uh, that kind of container Linux experience. So yeah, I have the, the IP address that it has here, which is basically the same as unknown, uh, well, it's SHN. Okay, cool, so I'm logged into Fedora Core OS. Um, you know, one of those things is like, yeah, we are deriving from Fedora. You know, you can run RPM-QA and it does work, right? Because if you're, this is one of those things that's actually quite important. It's like, what is inside my system? What kernel am I running? You know, what version of system D? If you're maintaining systems, you gotta have infrastructure to like track what you're running. And you know, RPM, I mean, it could be improved, but it works pretty well for this, you know, tracking what's inside your system. Um, so we're not we're not replacing that, and we basically, our team can focus on what we need to and inherit the Fedora kernel instead of. You know, Container Linux kind of was a derivative of Gentoo, and you know that's part of the what they had to do is maintain packages. We're doing less of that, uh, lets us focus more on containerization stuff. Uh, but you know, um, yeah, uh, there's a yeah. Let me try and find a yeah. So on the other hand, though, some things are different. Uh, oh, I should really. I don't know how you guys can see. I'll increase the font size a little bit. That. Let me do this. There we go. Uh, yeah, so by default, um, and this is something that we inherit that is true, was common to both Container Linux and, um, and Fedora Atomic Host and derivatives, is uh, the slash user, uh, user blah, is a, is a read only mount. Um, in fact, something we inherited now, yeah, I mean, it's a general OS tree system. Um, we also make slash directory immutable, and basically the only writable uh, directories are Etsy. You can write to Etsy, and you can write to uh, var. So real brief, really briefly here with OS tree, the idea is you have configuration in Etsy, which is very familiar, right? Um, but a corollary, corollary, corollary of this is you shouldn't have configuration outside of Etsy. 
right? All your configuration should be in at C period. And then further, all of your state should be in var. And the code is in user. You have this really clean separation between code that we manage, that's read only, the source of truth comes from Fedora, configuration and state is owned by you. And the difference between configuration and state is actually pretty important here because the best practice is to use ignition just to write to Etsy, broadly speaking. And then so your state is written by programs. Um, so one, uh, one thing we maintain with RP Mostry is, uh, for those of you who are familiar with uh, traditional Fedora systems, you know, just the way it's worked for a long time, the RPM database was in var, which is basically wrong in this model because it's, it should be immutable and owned by the OS. So one of the things is we move it to slash user. It's just an example of um, how things are going on. So the separation between this is pretty important to understand. Let me run a, a find mount. So yeah, when I'm booted into this live system, let me actually demo one other thing here. Do you notice here, there's no disks in this system. I basically, I'm just living inside this, uh, living inside a transient system. I actually don't like the term live because the antonym is sort of confusing. It implies non-live systems are dead. No, it doesn't make sense. Uh, probably a better word is actually ephemeral. Um, yeah, kind of idea is everything here goes away. It just lives in RAM. If you look at the, the file system mounts, here we have a writable Etsy that's an overlay FS that points, um, yeah, it's basically all coming down to a temp FS. And the, we also have a read-only squash FS. Like, that's where the real root is. So if you're booted in this system, now, so, you know, some things work. Uh, pull Docker kind of busy box. So hopefully this one works over the Wi-Fi. I didn't catch this one. At least it's small. So you can do this. And you know, one of the important things here is all the, um, all the container state is stored here. So when I did that pull, you know, Podman wrote um, some stuff here. This is, uh, yeah. That's the, that's the image. It hasn't created a root file for it. But the point is basically, when you did that podman pull, it wrote to var and not etsy. Because it's not configuration, it's state, basically. Um, cool, OK, so let me go back here. Demoed that. So yeah, I mentioned it's live. It runs from RAM. Now, you can have disks. And that's what I'm going to demo next. So this, this starts to like get into trade-offs between the two systems. Um, yeah, I mentioned the OS is in RFS. One difference here, if you, if you look at traditional uh, Fedora and RHEL systems with Anaconda, Anaconda basically is a live system. Like That's what it does. It basically just runs out of RAM. It's just its role is to install the OS, you know, to do partitioning and all that stuff on your whatever you, disks you want to install to and, and then go away. Whereas here, we're kind of emphasizing the use case of you can just run it persistently. You can provide a nation config and run from RAM. Uh, I, one thing I actually forgot to add to these slides is that if you do want to do an install to disk, running the installer is just something you run via ignition from Fedora Core OS. You can just write a system to unit that runs our installer and point it at a disk. So it's just one of the things you can do. And that's, so it's basically a generalization of that Anaconda model. Another difference with Anaconda is for size reasons, because Anaconda well, at least some builds of Anaconda include basically a full desktop. There's limitations on the init RFS size. There's a stage two that sort of basically go in the init RFS and then it fetches a whole other file system. We aren't doing that yet. Um, we may have to do that eventually. Uh, we'll see. So I talked a lot about what, gave you a lot of demos, but actually, and you know, maybe some of you are, have already downloaded the live image. Maybe you're you know, logged into the console on one of your bare metal servers. You're like, this is cool. Why am I doing this? Right, so a good example use case here is basically on-premise systems, diskless, and you're really emphasizing compute. You know, I've definitely heard from some RHEL customers that have large fleets of bare metal servers, and they really want them to run all the same thing. Um, I'll get to stateless in a second. So they do basically, there's no persistent storage. Uh, I think in their case they were doing NFS root, which we don't really support. I think we really want to emphasize this live pixie model, because honestly, it's just kind of better. Um, it, yeah, it just it, it works better. I won't go into a lot of details for that. And the compute portion, so like, let's say you're doing a bunch of numerical simulations. Great thing to do, package those as containers. And then you can write ignition configs that run podman and pull those containers. 
do your computation, and then write it, to, you know, do a post, an HTTP post to some server. Uh, and yeah, that, that's kind of a, a good use case for this live type of Pixie setup. Uh, of, now, in this scenario, right, like one of the things I just said is that it's kind of, we're providing some base level infrastructure for this. We're, in, you know, invested in Ignition. We're invested in, you know, providing an OS update stream and testing it, all that stuff. But it is kind of up to you then in this scenario, okay, how do you do orchestration? That's kind of a bring your own scenario, which can be good if you're doing something custom. Yeah. Oh, wait. Where did I? Yeah. So why wouldn't you do this? Well, one reason is that it actually, we're not really using OS tree here, the OS tree aspect of Fedora Core OS, because that's basically about maintaining in place updates. And since there's no persistent storage, or there's no, we're intentionally not doing persistent storage for the operating system, like OS tree doesn't do much here. Um, it can tell you what version the OS is, uh, but not more than that. Which is so, very useful. what? Which is very useful. Yes, it is, it is useful. Um, Reminds me, I need to demo something else if I don't run out of time. So, okay, yeah, bring your own orchestration. Yeah, so it's just not on our primary path, but we're definitely supporting this, actually partially because it's now a critical path for the install to disk. Like the, the uh, yeah, the persistent path is just a subset use case of this live fixing. So we're, we're heavily testing it. It's just that, for example, the Zincati process, let me go and demo that. Yeah, if, you've, if you're logged into Fedora, Fedora Core OS system, um, that is, Zincati is one of our custom services. And what you see here is it basically has a systemd unit that says, I'm not going to run if this is a live system. There's a slash run OS tree live stamp file. So Zincati doesn't run, doesn't try and apply OS updates. Just yeah, important aspect of this. Um, yeah, and so I've definitely talked to a lot of RHEL customers that really want their they want to make sure that their system's in their desired state. Like they've, you know, had an admin log into a node as a one-off and maybe change something as, you know, a hot fix, and then that kind of sits there and is a time bomb for later, right? You don't want that. Um, what some of them do is basically kind of once a month at least, they just, whatever happened, just flush and reprovision a node. It just makes sure that you really have all your state stored in revision control or managed somewhere else. Um, do that kind of on a rolling basis. Honestly, I think that's very much a best practice. If you're running, for example, uh, OpenShift 4 today, one of the cool things introduced with that is the machine API, which manages provisioning of underlying virtual machines in an infrastructure as a service scenario. So you could totally write a controller that just periodically looks at uptime and like does an OC delete machine slash blah, and that'll, that'll kill, the, kill the VM. And like OpenShift will actually react to this, make sure it drains the node beforehand, and maybe scale up a new node in response. Definitely in best practice, I'd actually like to see that in machine API. And that's the kind of thing you could script in your infrastructure, even if you're doing persistent installs, right? Like that's not something we provide code for, but you could do it. Um, and obviously, if you don't have any disks, um, but you do have a lot of data, it does mean that if for some reason all the machines power cycle at once, maybe you have an electrical blip or something, you know, when all those machines come back up, they're all going to be getting all their uh, data over the network again, and it's not a, it can be a non-trivial cost. Right? So um, you just have to be aware, it basically makes applying updates more painful. But again, going back to the control, it's your computers, you have total control. Like once you've configured that Pixie server to boot a specific version, that's, that's what you're going to run, right? Nothing's going to go and change that unless you change it. Uh, yeah, so let's, there's a lot of good docs here on Ignition. One of the things I, uh, that needs to be emphasized. The, one of the cool parts about running Ignition in the initial RAM disk is that it can do disk partitioning. Because if you're doing installs on bare metal, that's absolutely critical, right? Um, the disk partitioning path also works in the cloud. So we have a provisioning path, again, that works symmetrically in bare metal and cloud. So if you want to, for example, create a separate VAR partition on your cloud images, uh, your Fedora Core OS cloud images, that works great today. Um, because we, we run early enough to do that. Um, we're also, so something we're actively working on is basically support for dmcrypt slash lux, so that if you want to encrypt your root file system, again, doing that in the cloud makes a lot of sense. If, you, you know, if you're saying, okay, well, my AMI or whatever is encrypted, 
Yeah, probably, but that's like invisible encryption that you can't see, and they could just not be doing it, and you wouldn't even know. Whereas if you have dmcrypt inside the OS, you know. Again, it kind of goes back to, uh, yeah, some scenarios where it makes sense. So the sort of core, idea, core stuff you'd craft together in the scenario, you may have private CA certificates, so that's something you'd include in your ignition config. And then kind of one of the things I mentioned before is you have your numerical simulation packages container. Your ignition config has a systemd unit that says podman run blah, and that could be it. Um, so let's talk a little bit about mixing the trade-offs of these two. So if, yeah, if you have large container images, like it's not just the OS size, like right now I think the, init, the live Pixie init RAM OS is something like 600 megs. If you have some, you know, like hundreds and maybe gigabytes of container images, when you do that reboot, repulling all those can be really expensive. So one of the things you can do is basically have a persistent disk for slash var. So let me, let me find that var persist. Oops. Yeah, that's the rendered ignition config, which I didn't demo yet. That's the JSON. This is the Fedora core OS config. So there's a couple things going on here. It's a little bit more advanced. I included my, uh, my SSH key. But what you can see is a systemd mount unit that basically mounts the var partition. Um, here's where uh, Ignition is running. So we basically, this is the storage section of Ignition right here. Uh, and we are creating it with the label var, which is what this thing finds. Uh, we're giving it a provided size. We're saying we want it to be XFS in this case. Now you can do a lot more advanced things. And I just want to emphasize, you can pass this exact same Ignition config in a cloud instance or bare metal, and it works just fine. So what I'm going to do here is go ahead and uh, where is, yeah, add hardware. So let's say I have a disk. I really want it to be verdeo because if you notice my Ignition config references dev uh, VDA, which is verdeo devices. So, yeah. And this would be kind of, you know, just like if you're on a bare metal machine that happened to have some NVMe drives or whatever. Cool, so now my system has a disk. Um, if I booted it with this config, that disk would just be completely ignored. Like it should be untouched um, because nothing's, there's nothing that's configured to touch it. Uh, but what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna change the ignition config I'm providing to this var persist. And yeah, oh, I need to shut. Yep. Oh, I think I, it should go back when I shut down. Fur managers, let's see. Yeah, yeah, okay, now we're good. Yeah, that aspect of vert manager is really confusing. <laughs> Basically only shows your changes once you shut down. Cool, all right, so now we're, we're booting. Uh, ignition's running, we're doing a GCP request. And yep, yeah, and what scrolled by pretty quickly is it's basically creating that partition in var. And I'm gonna demo here when I SSH is, yeah, we're booted in the same IP address. I'll reconnect and now I do an LS block, and what you can see here is I have a partition mounted on var. So what, what's gonna happen here if I touch Etsy foo, um, that's gonna go away. Pull few box, or docker docker slash foo box, box. So I get in that scenario where, where you want this set up, but you wanna cache your container images or cache other data. Maybe you, I mean you could just imagine any kind of on disk cache. Uh, if your software is sort of written in a way that, you know, maybe it checksums that data like it's an object store, so it's identified by its checksums, so like you're very careful about how you manage state, then you can, uh, you can do that with external disks even in a live Pixie scenario. So, so if I run Podman images, BusyBox will be there. Uh, yeah, I'll reboot the system. So again, in an ordinary live Pixie scenario, if you reboot, again, everything goes away because it's in RAM. Just give it a second. We still do DH, uh, GHCP and the NFS. Ignition did not run on this boot, though. Uh, or no, it did run on this boot, sorry. Yeah, we refetch and reapply the Ignition config. Um, on a persistent scenario, Ignition would not rerun. So if we go back here, remember I touched Etsy something. Who? Yeah. Yeah, it's not there, but uh, Podman. Oops, if I could type. Podman. Images. I have this box, right? So it's still there. Um, so you can kind of mix the trade-offs. So think I'm running out of time. So 
One of the cool things I think Andrew wanted me to demo I didn't quite get to is like if you want to like test something in the cloud, you could, again, boot that same ignition config. If you want to capture your state, all you need to do is serialize var, and basically you have your system. Fedora OS is uploaded everywhere. You have your config in ignition. You have your state in var. You can put those things together anywhere you want to have them. Uh, yeah, so one of the things I should definitely mention is this is not yet shipped by OpenShift. Uh, let, me, let me just finish real quick, and then we'll do questions. Um, we're, we're almost certainly going to ship this, um, but running it persistently, like we don't have a story for how this would work with the machine config operator because it breaks OS updates for the most important parts of OpenShift 4 and that like, you don't need to think about it. Um, but yeah, one of the things we do like about the live image though, I think in this scenario is that you can use it just to play around and test things like what are, what are my nicknames? Because like right now we just, it's just not an ergonomic thing to do. Um, yeah, cool. So what a demo, Fedora, CoreOS, Live Pixie, kind of all a subset of what we're doing, but I think an interesting one that kind of illustrates the number of the, the trade-offs involved. Uh, yeah, it's available on the website now. So that's it. Does anyone have any questions? Yep. How to do kernel modules? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So that's something um, that heavily interacts with RPM OS3. Uh, we've gotten a lot of requests for this. I think the most, there's, the most recent one is actually maintained by Dusty. It's kmods via containers. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, there's a Fedora CoreOS tracker issue where we've debated this a lot. <laughs> Let me put it that way. But I think that's, that's the most promising approach we've gotten so far. And definitely check out kmods via containers. Um, so that should just work, right? Right. It does the build on boot, but I guess, you know. Well, if you have an NVIDIA GPU, I mean, it kind of falls in the numerical simulation case, right? Like, you want to load the NVIDIA module, which yeah, I think it should work. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's actually a great, like, one of the goals of this, right, is that you don't have GCC and kernel headers on your host, because, again, that's other stuff you need to, if you type yum update, it would drag in, but, like, we keep the host small, um, keep all your build stuff in the container. Cool. Any other? Yep. This one? Right, right. OK, so uh, the question basically, I think, is around how the disk is identified and uh, what happens when it's not formatted. So the, the identifying the disk is actually very simple in this scenario, because like, there's only one disk, and so I've just kind of hard-coded it. I think if you're in a bare metal scenario, like, you might end up having to do something where you template your ignition configs depending on like, the particular server. You know, like on this class of server, my newer ones, they have NVMe drives, and you know you need to write dev NVMe. Um, you could probably write a script that detected things and generated those system D units. That would work too, if be a little ugly. So that's kind of like the, I just sort of hard, hard coding dev VDA is cheating in this scenario. Yeah, it's, it's up here. So, um, well, okay, right. There's, there's a couple chains of things for how, so the storage section operates on the block level. This section says on dev VDA, first it says wipe the partition table. Uh, which, yeah, and then, and then it's saying make a partition with the label var, and uh, yeah, then, so that, that's basically what happens on the block level. Like, that's telling Ignition, find this device and apply the var partition. Um, so I think I, I only glossed over this. Basically, Ignition, by default, you can configure it to have create this file system if it doesn't exist, if it does exist, and that file system matches exactly what the ignition config is, then it gets reused. You can configure it that way, and that's what I was demoing here. So that was the block level, and then this is the file system section that says create XFS on that partition. Yeah, that's, that's the line by yeah. yeah that's, that's the key one here. It's a, yeah. So 
So the question is around bare metal and what happens if you specify the drive on the kernel command line. Uh, basically, don't do that. Uh, like, so if you want to do a persistent install, um, I mean, I, I can go to the Fedora Core OS doc. I, like, are, is that kind of what you're getting at? Is like, if you want to do an install to disk? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's um, docs install. Yeah. So if you go to the Fedora Core OS docs, um, there's actually two sections here now. So up here is what it looks. This is yeah. This is probably I should have mentioned this doc because it's it's a really good example. Um, you basically have here we have magical kernel arguments that are interpreted by the operating system to run a systemd unit that runs CoreOS installer. So here's what you're talking about, is this CoreOS install dev, dev SDA. Like that's what it'll look like if you wanted to do a persistent install. We do, we've, de we've debated the inst how the installer works recently because, again, it's a general system, so running installer is just one thing you can do. So like, kind of the idea is you have a systemd unit that runs that and you're not using the kernel command line. You don't know what the device name is? Yes. Right, so the question is around how do you handle scenarios where you don't know what the device name is? So it's a complicated one. There's not one answer to that, but I think one scenario here is if you have a class of servers, you boot one of them live, where the way they're identified should be the same. Now, it gets tricky, like, because um, you can actually find disks by their, ooh, I may get this wrong, their WWID. I think most modern hard disks have basically a UUID encoded in them, and you can find, that, that, find them that way, if that makes sense. There's not one solution to this, but you know, if your servers only have one NVMe disk, then it's kind of simple. Um, yeah, I don't think I can answer that in one, I don't think I can give you one answer to that, but you know, I basically recommend booting it live first and seeing what it looks like, and then kind of come back and craft your configs, if that makes sense. It does not work for automatic provisioning. Well, but once you know what the config is, then you come back and, and automate it, right? Like, once you know what the disk is, in the general, general case. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers that. Cool. Um, yep. So the question is, why wouldn't we want to use this for OpenShift 4? I think and this specifically being fixed live Pixie. Pixie. Yeah. So like the MCO today, like so applying OS updates, applying updates period is like we put a lot of effort in that in OpenShift 4 and a lot of effort in the MCO and managing OS updates. So I mean, it could make sense for workers. Um, it's just. Uh, I, Right. right. Yeah, that's. Right, right, right. I think yeah, that's that's the one of the yeah. Thanks, Dusty. That's definitely one of the biggest issues. And so what Dusty replies is that um, basically the kernel that's booted is not under control of the cluster anymore in that scenario, which means it's a kind of partially managed scenario. Um, and, you know, we could support that. I think it's just. Uh, it's just not a primary target right now. Like I think we basically I, like again. What I would recommend people that are running OpenShift today is like do that periodic reprovisioning, and that's going to get you ninety percent of the benefit of this, without all the drawbacks of making you know when a node reboots it re repulls all the containers. Right. It's basically what it comes to. But uh, yeah. Cool. All right. I think I'm out of time. Right. Oh, five minutes. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, okay. Um, you don't need two, two virtual machines. Okay, all right. Yeah, Dusty said there's a nicer way to do that in Libvirt, so I'll have to maybe update the talk later. Cool, all right. Thank you, everyone.